Our reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. When the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will not be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. While they were out in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened the mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? God, we come to you this day full of the events of the world, full of the events of our lives, full of the whisperings of our minds and our hearts. And we offer those to you. We place them at your feet. We place them at the foot of the cross and we give them to you. And we ask that for today, for this moment, for this time, you open us up to hear your words of grace, to hear the words you have for us this day, that they might fill us up and send us out. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord our God. Amen. So um, yesterday my sermon was different. Yesterday my sermon, I had a whole different sermon. It was going to be all about jealousy and um, the, how it's really the root of the reason that we hate each other, and it was, a, it was, an, it was an okay sermon. It was fine. Um, but I got home, and um, as I was trying to go to bed, I opened up um, my social media app, which is a bad habit. Don't do that. Um, and uh, it was filled with images um, from Israel. It was filled with images from Israel, and it was filled with um, not great, good images from Israel, some of them that I didn't want to see but I felt like I needed to bear witness to it because the story that is coming from Israel is an ancient story. It's an ancient story. It goes back to the beginning of time. We've talked about how the first six chapters of Genesis are what's called prehistory. It's the root. It's the, the stories that inform us of what the world is going to be like, who this God is and who the people who live in this world are like. And the first six chapters of the Bible are filled with stories that are not flattering for us humans. We don't come off in a good light. And it's an ancient story, this fight brother against brother. It fills up our news every day. When Russia invaded Ukraine, it was, if nothing else, a fight of brother against brother, of two peoples who are more alike than they are different who share the same history together. Russia is named Russia after the homeland, which was Ukraine. 
And Israel and Palestine are fighting, if nothing else, as brother against brother. As two ancient peoples who lay claim to a homeland, both who have righteous claims to it. And it's an ancient story of brother against brother. And then I turn on my local news and it's not much better. It's filled with stories of um, threats on social media. It's full of stories of football games, which should be fun, which are not, which are instead acts of terror. It's an ancient story. It goes back to the beginning of time. And its roots are the same as it always has been. Cain and his brother Abel. Now Adam and Eve, when they were sent out from the garden, were given a task. Adam was told to toil the soil, to toy, to toil the soil, that's hard to say, and to raise animals and to propagate them and to spread them over the earth. This was Adam's job, and so he passed along to his two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain, who was a gardener, farmed the ground. And farmers know how capricious that can be, how difficult farming can be, how dependent you are on the soil to be good to you. Abel, on the other hand, raised animals, probably sheep. And they were doing okay. They were living their life, they were taking their responsibility, but even from the beginning when God told to Adam that all people were responsible for toiling the earth and raising the animals, Cain and Abel separated themselves from each other. They both take offerings to God. Cain takes of the first fruit, and Abel offers some of his sheep. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that one is worse than the other. I grew up as a child being taught that Cain's offerings were not as good as Abel's, and that is why God did not favor them. But it turns out when you read the actual words of Scripture, there is no judgment on the quality of their offerings. Abel brings what he has. Cain brings what he has. And yet somehow Cain decided that God liked Abel better. We don't know why. We don't know how. We don't know what message Cain got to make him think that. But I think that Cain just thought that God liked Abel better. Maybe his job was a little bit easier. Maybe Abel made a little bit more money off of his sheep than Cain made off of his fruits and vegetables. But for whatever reason, Cain and Abel began to hate one another. Cain, because he was jealous of what he saw as God's favor to Abel. And so Cain takes Abel out into the field, and out of jealousy and hatred and spite, and out of his own insecurity, kills his brother. It's an ancient story. And it happens all the time. It repeats itself throughout scripture. These two brothers who hate each other, Jacob and Esau who cannot get along, who fight from even when they're in their womb, who have to separate and eventually come back together to bury their father. Or Isaac and Ishmael who were the products of jealousy and insecurity who people who didn't believe or trust God to be enough, they separated and went their separate ways, unable to be in the same room together, brother against brother. And they come back together to bury their father. It happens throughout the scripture. It happens all the way through to the New Testament where we tell children the story of the prodigal son, one, the younger son who goes and leaves his older brother behind, who goes off into the world and adventures and seems to have all the blessings of God until he doesn't. And when he returned home, instead of his older brother celebrating his return, his older brother gets mad and leaves the house. Brother against brother both driven by their insecurities and their fear and their hatred and their jealousy of one another, unable to be in the same room together. It's a story that is as ancient as time. 
Now, I grew up Presbyterian, and I never once heard the phrase total depravity in church. <laughs> I've never heard the phrase total depravity until other people, um, usually people from other denominations, say, you know, I could be Presbyterian except for that total depravity thing. <laughs> We don't normally use the word total depravity, and it doesn't mean that you're as bad as you can possibly be. That's not what it means. Total depravity just means that we recognize that the world is broken and that the people in it are beholden to our sin, which is true. How often do we act out of our insecurity and our fear? How often do we make choices out of our hatred, out of our inability to see other people it's just true, and it was not discovered by a Presbyterian, and it's been part of Christianity since the third century, when Augustine first wrote about the reality of sin, and that it's always rearing up, ready to take its grip on your shoulders. It's always whispering in your ears, trying to get you to act out of that part of yourself that maybe you're not so proud of. And it's easy for us to sit in judgment of these brothers against brothers, and it's easy for us to declare a winner on each side, but there but for the grace of God go we. We are always too eager to enter into this ancient story of brother against brother, to enter into this ancient story of violence against one another, maybe not physical violence, but often still violence. broken a little bit inside. We are tainted by the sin that comes with us. And if the origin stories of the Bible tell us anything, it's that we are no different. That we could both be Cain pretty easily. We could both be Adam and Eve pretty easily. We could all be that older brother standing in the house, not rejoicing because his brother came home, but upset because he might have to share in some of our blessings too. It doesn't mean that we are as broken as we can possibly be, and it doesn't mean that we aren't full of grace just as well. It just means that sin is always inside of us, whispering to us lies about ourselves. Lies about ourselves, lies about other people. We are not as bad as we think we are, nor are we as good as we think we are. Other people are not as blessed as we think they are, and, or, nor as unblessed as we think they are. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us are capable of being in the midst of that brother versus brother cycle. That does not mean that grace doesn't abound. Doesn't mean that grace can't be found. I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of um, the Brandenburg Gate. Brandenburg Gate is in Berlin. Um, it was built in the mid-19th century as um, a testament, a monument to the opulence of the newly formed country of Germany. Um, the Brandenburg Gate, much like the, the Eiffel Tower, you may have seen the Eiffel Tower, sometimes the Big Ben, um, the Empire State Building, we light them up for things, you know, we put things on them. Um, and while I was scrolling through these pictures last night, I ran across this picture of the Brandenburg Gate, which is incredible. This was an actual picture taken last night at the Brandenburg Gate. As soon as they discovered what was happening in Israel, Germany put up the flag of Israel in the middle of Berlin. And maybe you aren't a history buff like me and you don't remember why this is amazing, but I'll show you why, because the next picture is also the Brandenburg Gate, 80 years ago. And if this if this, the symbol of hatred towards Jewish people, can turn into the Israeli flag overnight, 80 years is overnight in history, then God's grace abounds. You can take it off. God's grace abounds. It means that nothing is so far gone it can't be redeemed by God. It means that God is constantly working inside of us to get us to speak not out of that whisper of sin, but instead to speak out of the grace that God pours into our heart. It means that God is empowering us to make a choice that is different than the one our instinct maybe tells us to make. 
God's grace isn't the ability to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you're good. It doesn't mean that you get material blessings. It's not an offering of wealth. It's none of that thing, none of those things. What God's grace is, is the promise that sin is not the only voice you hear in your ear. That when sin whispers into your ear hatred and violence and fear and insecurity and all of those things, it's also whispering just as loudly the voice of God saying, you're enough. With me, you are enough. There is enough for everybody. There's enough for us to share. There's enough for us to extend love to people who may not respond in the way that we would like. You are enough to face your fear, whatever it is that you're carrying around that you're afraid of. You are enough to share what is in your heart. You are enough to step into the gate, to step into the darkness, and to say the darkness will not overcome me because I carry with me the light of God. Grace just means that God's voice speaks in our ear too, that our God's voice can overwhelm the impulses inside of us which drive us into the brother versus brother cycle, which remind us that our insecurity maybe is telling us the truth. God speaks into that and offers you the grace to take a step back. And instead of firing off a response on Facebook to a friend who posts something that you don't like, maybe God's voice of grace is whispering into your ear to extend peace, and to be an example. Uh, this Friday night, we had Statesville after dark. It was a lot of fun. We had a good time. Um, while we were doing our tour together, um, there were some street preachers downtown. They were preaching. They were yelling some things that I wouldn't have agreed with, right? And we walked by them and they handed me this booklet of literature and um, I opened it up to the first page and said, yep, okay, and threw it away, <laughs> right? And I thought, how terrible, we're having a great night and this guy's out here yelling. Um, and then on the way to my car, I stopped by a table that was outside and this group of people said, um, hey, what are you guys doing? Because we were a big group, there was, a, you know, like a hundred, well, depends on who you ask. John said it was like 65, Frank said it was 130, so it was somewhere in between there. Um, <laughs> you know, a large group of people wandering downtown Statesville. And they asked me what they were doing because I had my name tag on, and I said, oh, we're just, you know, we're a church, we're having some fun together. Um, we're learning a little bit about Statesville, and we're having some fun together. And they said, oh, I didn't know churches could do that. I said, well, our church does. And they said, oh, where'd you go to church? Where, where do you go to church? And I said, where do you go to church? And I said, oh, well, I'm the preacher at Concord. And at, like, for a minute, they went, oh, how do I find out more about that? Well, I said, you can like us on Facebook. Go to concordpresschurch.com. We're right there. You can look us up. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll do that. We want to see what else you got. I said, normally we do a trivia night in the spring. And they said, yeah, we'll come to that, which just reminds us that grace is always in action, even when people are shouting words of hate on the street. We can be that voice of grace, and it may feel like a drop in the bucket, and that family may never do anything, but that's fine. They've at least heard that it's possible to have a faith not surrounded by hate. That we can be in that place, and maybe it doesn't feel like we're making a big difference, but we are. You are changing the life of somebody, one person, and that life is changed because they've heard the words of grace that reminds them that they're more than the fear. And they're more than whatever the worst thing somebody said about them. And if nothing else, God is calling us to help turn the Brandenburg Gate into an Israeli flag. And no, you can't do that by yourself. But we're a group of somewhere between 20 and 300, depending on who you ask. And we can change the world. <laughs> One drop at a time. One light at a time. We can say there's an option other than brother versus brother where we fight with one another. There's a different option where God offers brother with brother. And that is the grace of God. You can do it. We can do it. We don't have to let sin win, and we don't have to let hatred win, and we don't have to let violence win. And so I challenge you to go out this week and offer grace to people. Be liberal with it. There's plenty of it to go around. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen.